Welcome to the Lady Landlords Podcast, where we empower women to gain financial independence through real estate investing. I'm your host, Becky Nova, founder of Lady Landlords. If you're ready to buy, manage, and grow your real estate portfolio, then let's get started. Welcome back to this week's episode of the Lady Landlords Podcast. Today, we have the Lumberjack Landlord joining us today. Matt, how are you doing? I'm doing super awesome. It was a little too hot for flannel today, so I just had to wear the branded t-shirt. <laughs> we made sure we could see that for those watching yeah. on YouTube, because I love Lumberjack. your little logo. Man. There you go. <laughs> yeah. That's inspired by children, you know? <laughs> I fit right in. Have we thought about getting Lumberjack Landlord dolls? Little stuffed animals that we can we can get. Oh, well, that one's not exactly so very cuddly. Yeah, I like it's, it's, head. it's not cuddly at all. But my wife would say that this is more like reality with me. So you know, yes, no, and not cuddly. But um, but yeah, we will look into we we will be looking at a line of extremely plush toys to follow my stature. Good. We'll be trading and selling them just like Beanie Babies soon enough. So, <laughs> yeah, so you sure. let me know. I want one then. But, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, thank you for joining. I appreciate you taking the time. You have sure. just such a great story of your real estate investing journey. So I'm, I appreciate you coming on and sharing it with our lady landlords. But could you just start by just sharing a little bit about who you are and where you kind of came from? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, super excited to be here. First of all, I'm a fan. And so it's always yeah. fun to work with someone you're a fan of. So I appreciate all that you do. And uh, I mean, real briefly going into my story, it's really quite awesome. And one of the reasons that, you know, I think I'm just the most excited to be here is because i um, raised by a single mom. I have five sisters. I have 21 first cousins that are all girls. And so I think that girls absolutely have a place in landlording. I would love to see a lot more of it. So, um, but yeah, my name is Matt. I'm a lumberjack landlord. Uh, I got named the lumberjack uh, based on the career that I have. And I showed up for work. I work in tech. I showed up and I had a flannel shirt on and instantly I was the lumberjack. And I was like, <laughs> guys, that's so dumb and not original. And then I just owned it and then became a landlord and lumberjack landlord. And there you go. But uh, I'm a ninth grade dropout, as I said raised by a single mom. Um, so work, working hard, you know, is just, you, you see that with single moms, you have to, they have to work hard. There's no option. There's no stop. And so really that work ethic, second generation, um, second generation immigrant. So my grandparents came over, uh, actually from Ukraine and, um, Work ethic, that is what is instilled in this family is work ethic, work ethic, work ethic. And if you think you've worked hard, I'm sure you have more left that you can give. So that's what's kind of instilled here. But yeah, ninth grade dropout, raised by a single mom. Um, to make ends meet, mom actually got in real estate as kind of a second job. She was also a teacher. Um, and then she uh, then she walked away from teaching and got all into real estate. Um, and uh, she did that for a number of years until she passed. But I was, because she was a single mom, at 9, 10, 11 years old, I was in the car because I was not old enough to watch myself. Uh, I begged to differ, but I had mm -hmm. to go on showings. I know what my Saturdays were. My Saturdays, every Saturday, were going on showings. And so I was in it. And then finally, when I got old enough, I said, I do not, I do not want anything to do with real estate uh, <laughs> because I spent, you know, until I was about 12 years old and able to watch myself, I had to be on all those showings. So, um, so yeah, I got into tech and I've been doing that for, I didn't go to college, didn't finish high school. Um, I've been in tech for 25 years. Um, it's been a great ride, but I started investing about 22 years ago. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. Um, right. I'm going to definitely break a couple of those things down. I'm taking sure. notes as we're kind of talking here, yeah. um, about, kind of how you get started, but really what I actually want to first touch on is your experience seeing your mom in real estate. So yeah. you kind of talked about, you knew what you were supposed to do on Saturdays. You knew that you were going to showings. What, what did you kind of see your mom doing? Was that something that you were just kind of like, Hey mom, why can't you just go get a nine to five job? Like other people, you said she was a teacher. So she yeah. clearly kind of had that, but mm -hmm. was it something that, and then it clearly, it sounded like it turned you off in real estate originally. Was it something that you kind of wish maybe she was kind of like the other moms that just took you to soccer practice on Saturday? Or what was what was your experience watching her life? Yeah, thankfully you can only see like this point up from me because I'm not built for soccer. 
I'm built for heavy lifting. <laughs> and that's it. I probably um, should have went with a different sport. Yeah, but. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. But I, I, so it was, yeah, I mean, it was just, you know, you can't really, I mean, young enough that you don't really know what's going on other than mom's always on the phone. Like mom is always on the phone. So, you know, we were always quiet. My sister and I that were closest together, the older ones had left. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it was quiet in the household. We had professional phone voice, um, you know, which was anytime the phone rang, it was assumed that it was a client, which I mean, my mom was so frugal. She wouldn't buy the stinking second line, you know? So okay. it was like one line into the house, one line only. And that was before cell phones, really largely speaking. You probably um, had call waiting, right? Had call. Well, yeah, that came, yeah, that came about. And so even when you were on the phone with a friend, it was like, hold on a second. Then it was, hi, Coldwell Bank. Oh, Matt, Matt, Coldwell Bank or Matt speaking. How can I help you? And like, your son. Yeah. 10, 11. Yeah. 10, 11, 12. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it was, oh, um, just a moment. Let me cheat. Let me see if she's in. And of then course. it was always <laughs> like, yeah, it was like, it, and my mom would every once in a while, she'd be like, I better get compliments from people with how you guys answer the phone. I was like, got it. So she got that, really put you guys to work. <laughs> hard. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I was, I was, uh, yep. I was cheap labor. So it was good, but yeah, every part of it, it was, it was, a, it was an experience as an agent. You are, you need to, if you want to be elite, you need mm -hmm. to be available 24 seven. Right. I always think it's interesting when like, I've heard people kind of say like, Oh, I just want to do something that like, I just have like time freedom and could just like make extra easy money. I'm just going to go sure. get like my real estate license. And I'm like, I don't think you have any idea. Or people ask me if I like ever have intentions of becoming a realtor. And my response is always, no, I know how crazy I drive my realtor. Yes. That man earns every penny yeah. that he makes because I call him at seven o'clock in the morning. I call him at seven o'clock at night. Uh -huh. I call him on Sundays. I call him on Tuesdays. So that's interesting that your experience was really seeing her involved in this kind of 27, 24 seven world, in addition to them, her working a, a full-time job as well. Yeah. I mean, for us, it was us on all the time. And I think that, you know, right. she had, you know, she had kind of, you know, walked away, she kind of walked away from the teaching thing because she needed to be available to us, the kids and, you know, dad, dad wasn't around. And right. so, um, and you know, where she, where she worked was too far away and where we were living. And so she was just like, yeah. I just need to do something else. And so that real estate was that something else. And so it was, it's hard to get into, it's hard to get relationship. It's hard to create a funnel. Um, yeah. and I think that she got into real estate in the late eighties. So it was booming, moving a little bit and then yeah. it fell apart. Right. So Interesting. But that's it. So, but then that experience. So once again, she was a realtor, not the investor side, but yes. you had mentioned that that was something that actually turned you off from real estate. Yes. Why was that? I don't like being somebody else's. This is an, this is a absolutely a leash. Right. And then we didn't even have those. And so Matt's holding his cell phone, by the way, yes. for anybody so, that's listening exactly. to the podcast. So <laughs> yes, exactly. I know we're audio and visual. Um, but that's the, but that's the challenge, right? Is that now you have these, so you can leave your home. You could not leave your home before. If you were a brand, right. it was, it was, you know, asses and elbows. It was in the seat on the computer, on your phone. Mm -hmm. And then it was driving properties. And so it was like, there was nothing appealing to that. Nothing appealing about that to me. I was just like, you can't go anywhere. You can't do anything. And you always have to be available. And that's for the person that might, you know, like a normal market where they might shop yeah. for a month or two. And mm -hmm. then she had some that shopped for six months and they'd seen a hundred homes. And I was right. like, even if you close a three or $400,000 transaction, so math is a little bit of a strong suit for me, but I said, mm -hmm. even if you close a three or $400,000 transaction, you're going to make less than the kid bagging groceries at market basket. Like. Right. When you divide up the amount of time and work and yeah. who knows how many yeah. different showings you had to do and what the drive was there and the hours that you had to put into that. Uh, yeah. Hours and gas and time and weekends and, you know, this one just- And holidays. And and and, yeah. There, it, there are no holidays. There aren't. Any and also going back to the whole phone difference, right? Yeah. When you used to actually have to, when we actually had like phone numbers in our houses, which yes. was, you know, nobody has these days and a cord phone. Right. Yes. Also, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you go, you go to meet a client, you go to do a showing, they don't show. You can't just pick up a phone and call and see where they are, yeah. know that they're running late, know That's if right. they're actually going to show. Then all of a sudden you come all the way home, 
maybe you had an answering machine. We, my family, I grew up poor. We didn't have answering machines. So you yes. yeah, I had to have somebody actually answer, answer the call, <laughs> right? But you hope then maybe you got a message to see if this person was actually going to follow up with you or not. There was no way of kind of right. being able to track them down. So it was much more of a hustle. So I can see that you were like, nope, this isn't for me. Yeah, hard but, time. So real estate, we already knew as a kid was not for you. We'll come back to that. Then you realized school was not a fit for you. No, I was <laughs> so bored out of my mind. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't. Right. I just, it was just like, oh, this is so useless. I am never going to be an engineer. So I have no interest in calculus or algebra. I have no interest in it. I'm not going to ever use it. It's just like, interesting that math is one of your strong suits. Yeah. Business but math. But not calculating yeah, a exactly. triangle. Bus Business math in my head, business rules, done. Like, right. yeah, build a company in an afternoon, not hard. Um, but when it comes to any of the engineering or advanced math, I find mm -hmm. no value in it. And so it was like the same thing with um, like art and all these other classes. And I was like, I if I want an appreciation for it, I'll look into it. I don't. Right. So and so that was the, my best sales job in my life was convincing my mother that I, as a teacher, that I didn't need to go to school anymore. And then you left at ninth grade. So did. what did you do during those, still your teenage years? I opened up my own business. Nice. Yep. Opened what did up you my do? own business. Anything that would pay me that was legal. Yeah. So <laughs> it was, it was, uh, I had a paper route. I had that I, you know, rode my bike on. I was, you know, 13 years old. So I couldn't, I couldn't ride, drive a car. So I had a paper route. Um, and it was, you know, in New Hampshire, you can, you know, have 170 to 180 houses. That takes wow. you an hour and a half to ride that. It's not like it's a building where you just walk and take the elevator and next floor, next floor. Yeah. New York um, city here. I could do that in like five minutes. So. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I got to literally ride my bike like seven miles round trip to hit that many houses. <laughs> and so that was, so that was, that was one of the things. And then it was landscaping. And then I was really into sports, love sports. And so I got into sports cards at younger as a kid and then just made it a business. Um, you know, it was like um, buying, selling, trading sports cards. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. A lot like Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, we, we are a lot alike. He's just the smaller version of me and much more wealthy version. Um, but we're, <laughs> other than that, we're a lot, yeah, it curses quite a bit more, but the rest of it's pretty much the same. So that Beckett price guy would come out, I'd memorize everything. And that way it yeah. was like, I would be at, you know, trade shows at 14 where they're like, Hey, you need to pay for your table to be here. It's 40 bucks. And it was like, I get dropped off with my, with my materials by my mom and I would hand the guy 40 bucks and I go set up my table and I'd work the day yeah. and I was a deal maker. And so we would just try and put deals together and I'd sell enough cards where I covered my 40, cover the cost of my stuff, pay my mom 10 bucks for gas and, and, and what she did. And you know, then make, and then the rest of the money was then just take that. And it's like, whatever I need to live on, which was, you know, Coke and sugar or sugar and sugar. And <laughs> then reinvest the rest of the money right back into more cards so I could then have a better show the next show. And then it was just building that business. And, and I did that for years. And then how did you make that switch into tech? So made the switch into tech. I worked in a video store okay. um, and I wanted to go to be able to go to church on Sunday mornings, but the store opened up at 10 and I was like, who needs a video at 10 AM? I would say to the owner, <laughs> he's like people. I was like, what people I work at 10 AM and there's no one here. And I want to go to church. He goes, right. nah, nah. And so I found out that there was, I actually found a list of people that used to work there that had left on their own. And mm -hmm. so I called them and I was like, Hey, is there any chance I can get you to cover like two or three hours a week? I was like, just come in at 10 and I'll be here by 1230 or one every Sunday. And so, um, I got somebody to cover that. I worked in that store. I was making $5 and 25 cents an hour. My tax, my paycheck weekly was 167 after taxes. Wow. $167 a week after taxes. That's what my paycheck was. I remember those days. <laughs> yeah, it was hard. And so she worked the shift for me, but she worked for a tech company during the week and she comes and she, and she's like, you know, I think you'd really be good at sales. And I was like, nah, I'm a businessman. And they're like, I think you'd be really good at sales. It's like, I'm a businessman. <laughs> she's like, you're working at a video store. I was like, I'm yes. still a businessman. And so I kind of shunned it. I was like, yeah, sure. I'll give it a shot. And so went in. Uh, nailed the interview. And then they were like, we're going to pay you $18,500 a year. And I was like, you're going to pay me how much? <laughs> yeah, it's a little more than 167 a week. <laughs> it, exactly. I was like, Yahtzee, this is unbelievable. I'm going to literally make, I'm, I mean, my take home now is going to be like 400 bucks a month, 400 bucks a week. I know, you're rich crazy. now. 
Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm loaded. I'm loaded. <laughs> so I took the job and, um, you know, I'm broken, uh, you know, I- immigrant broken. Don't mm-hmm. know the word stop. Keep on going, keep on going, keep on going. A lot of the people that I teach this stuff to, immigrants, because they wanted a better life here. And they're willing to right. put in all the work and all the time. And they've got time and they'll make time and they'll do the hard work. That's where that respect comes from. And so um, just, I worked 90 hours a week in the telemarketing department. Wow. Is cold calling people? Cold calling. I would do on a typical week because we didn't have automatic dialers like Wall Street has. You had to dial the numbers and do the lookups and blah, blah, blah. I would do probably about 1,500 calls a week. Wow. um, Creating leads for the real sales guys. And so got pretty good at that. And then after six months, they were kind of like, we're going to promote you. I was like, I love this. (laughs) <laughs> and so then they promoted me into a rep job. The woman uh, decided, the woman that was in that position um, decided that she didn't want to come back from leave. She wanted to mm-hmm. stay home mm-hmm. and that created a spot for them instantly. And they said, we need to fill that territory. I took over that territory. And then uh, nine out of the next 12 months, I was the top rep in the world for that company. Wow. Yeah. And that's and what you still do today. You still work in your full-time job, correct? Yeah, I do. I do. I gotcha. just, yeah. Yep. I do. I work a lot, I work a yeah. lot. but it's good. So now you have now, and we've had salary increases from that point on, we've been yeah. able to grow and have promotions within that for sure. Yeah, yeah. But at what point did you say now that you're, you now that you're doing really well in tech sales, at what point did you say, Hey, I should invest in that real estate. Remember that back from when I was a kid, what kind yeah. of now bridge the gap into the real estate world? Yeah. So really the bridging of the gap was, um, I think I was, so I was 20 when I was in tech. Um, Mm -hmm. and I crushed it my first year. I made more money. Uh, you know, I made more money in the first three months in sales there than I'd ever made in a year. Wow. And huge difference. Yeah. Unbelievable. You know, I, uh, yeah, I know. I actually had a, I had one paycheck. the The paycheck that I got that third month, based on my second month commissions, mm-hmm. was more than I'd ever made in a year before. Wow! I was like, "This is unbelievable. This is thousands yeah. of dollars. This is." And so, uh, being in tech, talking to their guys, it's like you get in the stock market. So you get in right. the stock market, you learn the fundamentals, and you're kind of doing your thing. Blah blah blah. Um, this was in 1998, so okay. it was you know, Y2K and all that fun stuff. Um, But what really ended up coming of it was I get into the market and I get absolutely obliterated. Oh no, I wasn't expecting that. Yep, I got crushed. (laughs) 20,000 bucks turned into uh, two companies committing fraud and being one being delisted, one being put on uh, on a silence list where my stock went from 20 to uh, 89 cents. And I was like, yeah, so and they're like, so what are you gonna do? Sell it? And I was like, for the 89 cents times 300 shares? No, I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, this is all at a loss over I'm there. I'm just gonna hold this as a lesson. <laughs> um, so yeah, just got absolutely obliterated in the dot com, what ended up being the dot com bomb. Uh, and then, but I was still making good money. So then I just kept on saving the money. And then it was just looking at it and saying, Oh, I gotta do something with the money, and it's not going in the market because I think the market's tilted. You know, mm-hmm. I think that unless you're in Manhattan and talking around, you know, boardrooms and lunch parties and dinner parties and all those things, that's nothing but inside information that I'm never going to have because I'm never going to live there. Right. <laughs> and I think, that, and I think that's great, but I'm not going to ever be on the inside. And so I wanted yeah. something that just for a normal Joe, that just a normal guy that could save up my money and I could buy the next thing and it could give me a return on that capital. Um, okay. and so that's what I did. So I, so I just started investigating real estate and I picked a city uh, or picked the biggest city in New Hampshire, which is about 120,000 people surrounding it. <laughs> uh, picked that city and started. And, uh, that was kind of, I, the very first deal that I ever bought was I, I found a condo close to where I worked. I loved it. I couldn't afford mm-hmm. it. And so I said, okay. Man, that sucks. I can't afford it. And so I went to the bank and said, how can I afford this? He goes, you have to find a way to make an extra thousand bucks a month. I go, okay. So I started thinking, I was like, how do I do this? I was like, what if I get a roommate? It's a two bedroom. He goes, yeah, if you can get a signed lease, 
I was like, that's it? He goes, yeah. I go, oh. So I started burning up the phone lines, calling all my friends, calling all my friends' friends. Um, but they didn't live down there. So uh, I had a couple of friends that went to college down around there. And I said, I need to talk to as many of your friends as I can. And mm-hmm. so I finally met one and he was a cool guy. He's like, yeah, I'd love to live here. I was like, how about a thousand bucks a month? He goes, eh. And I go, I need a thousand. He's like, yeah, I guess I'll do that. I got him to sign a lease and I sent that with my app to my mortgage broker and we used that and we, and I, and I bought the condo. So the first property you bought was one that you lived in and then you rented yeah. out the extra room, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. yeah gotcha. I think that that's, I think that's the biggest mistake that people make is that they go from living in apartments and condos and they're mm-hmm. like, no, no, I own the place now. I don't want roommates. You don't want free money. What? Why? You don't yeah. want to it and have them pay you to live there. That's awesome. Right. And then I think people also break it when they say, no, I want the white picket fence all to myself. And I don't want to have anybody sharing a party wall with me in the, you know, the building, the, the unit next door. Why? Why? Right. I think that that's the best opportunity that we have in America today. Cause not only is it socially acceptable, but the bank loves it and you should love right. it. So that's what I did. I basically house hacked my first purchase. Um, and it's and- a great introduction to then kind of being that landlord, right? Exactly. To, exactly. to having the responsibility of those bills, to having the responsibility of the space. And I love the fact that actually you started with the condo too, as, as a person that grew up in the city, you know, it's a little bit easier to also understand like, hey, so I don't I don't necessarily have to do landscaping and cut grass. And, right. you know, I, I still possibly have a super, right? There's still some amenities that make it a little bit easier rather than a complete freestanding building. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, and yeah. you're in the game now. I'm in the game. I'm in the right. game. I had a problem and I fixed it with a roommate. Right. And there simple. Yeah. So and now you're making, now you have that extra money. Now you also have an asset. So we got first property. What made you say like, Hey, I'm going to do this again. Um, <clears throat> so probably a year and a half after I did that deal, uh, because it's a condo, I got my first thing called an assessment. The building got hit with an assessment. My share was $70,000. <laughs> I was like, you're, where's that money coming from? <laughs> I was, I was 20 two years old, 23 years old. I didn't have $70,000 anywhere. I mean, I could give you 70 grand worth of debt, but I don't have $70,000. And so really what I, I, so at that point I was just like, all right, we got to figure this out. It had appreciated over the course of two or three years. And so I just said, we just got to get out of this because this assessment, if it's, if based on what I'm seeing, there's no way we stop at 70. It's going to end up at 90 or a hundred or 110. And I can't afford 70. So I certainly can't afford 110. That's, right. that's my amazing math skills coming through. And so, you know, in, in looking at it, I just said, yeah, that just can't happen. And so I talked to the agent that I bought it from. I said, we just need to sell this thing. And so um, I started working, trying to find uh, a deal that I could, that I could afford without a roommate, um, mm-hmm. but one that I could bring a roommate into. So I was willing to do some, some essentially value add. I was like, I need to find a place that needs a little bit of work. It's kind of ugly. So I kind of found a single family home. Um, I was mm-hmm. like, yeah, I can do a roommate. That's not a problem, but it put me closer to where I wanted to be. Um, so I bought the single family home and then started rehabbing it so I could then move some roommates in. Right. Um, and then I was like, this works really well this way, but um, I hate having roommates now because I'd done it for years. I was like, I do not like roommates. <laughs> um, you know, if I want to be up until two o'clock in the morning and I want to have my you know music up loud, then that's what I want to do. Right. Um, and so I was like, so this works, but I need to think bigger. I need to think having my own unit and then having others have their units. Gotcha. And so that's so now started, was, let's do exterior. Yeah. Yeah. Now let's do, now let's start looking at duplexes, tries, and quads. Mm-hmm. And so that's what happened. I started looking at dupes, tries, and quads. And you still stayed in New Hampshire. Yep. hundred percent. Yep. Gotcha. So how did you go about finding some of those properties? So... <clears throat> I had heard because YouTube didn't really exist then. And right. so I had heard, you know, really that you wanted to stay with some places that had some population. That's kind of hard in New Hampshire because <laughs> we don't have a lot of population. We have 1.4 million people in the state. <clears throat> yeah. Like you have some apartment buildings that have 1.4 million people in them. Correct. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, that's about a city block. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So a little bit difficult to do. So I went to the biggest city and I said, that's what I'm going to do. And so I could figure out the math. I was good at the math. And I was like, yeah, these numbers work, um, mm-hmm. you know, based on, based on a 20% down payment, these numbers work. Right. So that's what I did. I, you know, took the money that I had saved up. And so Fannie Freddie or this 5% down concept, none of those things were available then. Right. You know? 
And so it was 20% down for me. And so that's what I ended up doing. I ended up buying a triplex for 20,000, mm -hmm. 20% down, uh, bought the property and then had to rehab a bunch of it on my own. Cause I didn't have any money to rehab it. That was one mistake I would say I made. Um, <laughs> I was like, I was like, Oh no, I used all my money for the down payment. Now I can't afford to fix anything. I'm going to have to figure it out. Which is also crazy that at the time, the bank also gave you a loan mm -hmm. to buy the property, knowing that then you would have nothing left. Yeah, I didn't have much left. Yeah, that whole Early six. 20, that whole, yeah, yeah, that six, exactly. Now you can tell it's 2002, right? You know? Right, yeah. I have that eight-month <laughs> emergency fund. <clears throat> you know, they're not like, well, we want to make sure that you can go six months. It was kind of like, I think I have like $3,000 left when I'm all said and done here. And that's not enough to fix much of anything. No. Um, and then also after you also have to pay for your attorney, your closing costs, you know, right. any other, you know, moving expenses, any of those types of things, you know, that already kind of eats up. And those are always extra costs that we sometimes don't necessarily consider. So that really left you with then no emergency fund, let alone rehab fund, which sounds like really what you needed. Yeah, really what it meant was I no longer was going to be able to move into the place because I kept a single family house. Yeah. So I kept a single family, had a roommate. Mm hmm then did the three unit, did a bunch of the work myself, but then rented out all three units. And gotcha. then that way I was like, okay, now I can pay myself back a little bit. Cause I'm still living on, I'm still living frugally. Like I'm literally at this point, I'm making a decent living. Um, mm -hmm. but my out of pocket living expenses, I am so unbelievably, we'll say frugal. Um, exactly. You but, still had a good, you were saving a ton of money. Yeah. I'm driving, I'm driving a $2,000 car, not $2,000 payment, a $2,000 car. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm my, my out of pocket monthly living expenses were like $350. Mm -hmm. And so it was like life on a dime and that's just, and so I could save up cause then it was, okay, this is really working. Then it was, I just, I, now I can speed up the process just by making more money, saving more money, having a smaller footprint. Um, you know, not going out to eat, like going out to eat to me was going to the Seven Eleven and buying the one night, $1.99 uh, burrito bombs that was my treat eating out it was two bucks right and i was gonna say like that's that's expensive you could have went with a total dollar menu here but you were really like splurging here on the 199 sadly the dollar menu did not exist at that time but the dollar no, menu no, no. did exist when i got married and we frequented that so that was <laughs> our option then so it was yeah. in your future <laughs> it, well, oh yeah it was i had to move up to the dollar menu because i could only afford the 199 but when you're in the dollar menu you need a drink you need fries and you need it and you need something to eat so it's like that's three bucks so it was that's where they kind of get you increase in spend that's where it gets you yeah <laughs> that's where they get you. so now you have you have your tripods you yeah. have your single family yes what point do we just kind of really like snowball this yeah so um so this is all in 05 06 mm -hmm deal started to not make sense anymore. Um, and so I, I ended up buying one more triplex. Okay. Um, but then, like I said, deals really started to not make sense anymore. It was like, if, even if I buy that, I lose money every month. Like I can't do a negative amortized deal. No. You know, as much as I, <laughs> as much as I want it, it's like rents are this. And so I have a concept called a rent box where part of everybody is concerned with what their purchase is. Mm -hmm. I believe in a rent box because my rents are what drive the margin on any deal. So if I'm far more keyed into rents, this is where I beat all of my competitors is that I'm focused on the rents. I'm not focused on what I'm paying for the place. I don't care. What I care about is what's the absolute sweet spot for rents. What's the plus 10% number. And then where's that put me to against my payment and against the deposit that I have to make. Generally speaking, if the price, if the property's 300,000 or a million dollars, I don't care. It's all about what that rent box tells me I can buy the place for based on what my costs are going to be and my return on capital is going to be. I call it the rock. So with that rent box, can you talk about the plus 10%? Yeah. So the plus 10% is things like, so just like people grade areas, A, B, C, and D, mm -hmm. I grade the area, but I also grade the quality of unit. A, B, C, and D, you know, gotcha. so D is like, it's got to be completely redone. C is that it's completely dated. You know, it's like, you know, asking Mr. Brady when Peter's going to be home, you know, and B is it's been recently updated. It's certainly plenty clean. It's been updated in the last 10 years. It's nice, but it's not cutting edge. 
And then A is this clearly has gone through a gut redo. Everything is brand spanking new in the last, you know, two or three years, maybe even for that unit. And then that's an A unit. And so that might be an A unit in a B area, but that's going to fetch for you that market plus 10% when you have a brand new unit that goes into that market. Because largely speaking, you're not going to compete. There's not a lot of brand new units that you're competing with. And I'm not talking new construction. I'm talking rehab. Talking rehabs. Gotcha. Okay. To that level. So, so with that, do you look for properties that have tenants in place or do you look for properties that are vacant? Yes. I, so not part of my Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> not part of, so I, 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 um, I like to take what the defense gives me, you know? Okay. And so if it's, I've got tenants coming with this one. All right. What are the considerations there? How far under market rent are they? How bad a condition is the place? How long have they been there? One of the, my weaknesses, my absolute kryptonite is folks that are older in life that have been in place for a number of years. I can't raise mm -hmm. their rents. It's my kryptonite. I can't raise their rents. I, right. I work with them and we have a lot of conversations before anything even gets raised, you know, 50 bucks. Um, and it's just like, hey, I got to at least maintain this level of margin so the bank doesn't get mad at me. Um, and that's purely driven by the bank. So we're not talking about profit. We're talking about margin that has to be there for the bank to stay happy. Right. Um, and so with tenants or without, so if it's okay. without and I'm taking it on without and it's not A or B, if it's C or D, then I just go to work and I do my thing and I value add. Um, okay. and I'll, redo, I'll redo the place. And that can be cabinets, floors, uh, never carpet, stay away from carpet. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, floors, whether it's refinishing 150, 160 year old farmhouses, um, or, you know, anything, of, anything of the like. So we can kind of go all the way to studs, original barn board, um, mm -hmm. or we can do something that was built in, you know, the seventies. So for you, it's really more of just, are the rents able to kind of cover what like, this mortgage payment's going to be? And can I make money off of what that looks yeah. like? Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're pretty... So you're almost kind of like reverse engineering your deal analysis here. Correct. Yep. 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 I do it backwards. I get it. But yeah. It's okay. So, cause again, for me, that's why I won so many deals in the last right. two years. I won a lot of deals in the last two years because people didn't understand where the rents were. And so they were like, yeah, 500 and they were losing a deal over $7,000. And I was like, okay, well, I, I, I'm humble enough to ask. So um, why, why'd you pick 500? <laughs> like, well, the rents, the rents are only 2000 bucks. Okay. And I just keep quiet because my rents, I got those units rented for 3000 bucks a piece. Right. So it shoot at he, so he DQ'd at 500 K I went to five and a quarter. I only paid 25 more, but I'm making two grand more a month. Right. Which is so, kind of no worth wonder, it. No wonder <laughs> I'm crying. Them, right. So that's why I like to continue to ask those questions and learn is that even though I've got 41 buildings, even though I've got 121 units, mm -hmm. I started with one. And I built right. my business and I don't have partners other than my wife. Um, I don't have anybody infusing capital. Um, this is 100% me and going and getting loans from banks. And what types of loans do you tend to use for your properties? Um, so for the longest time, so Fannie, Freddie, as you know, they'll let you do 10. Mm -hmm. And then what ended up happening was the great recession that mm -hmm. cut me down to four, but I already had five. So I was shut off. So then I just started talking to banks about commercial debt. Okay. I don't love commercial debt because it's three, five, and seven interest only or, or re adjustable. Mm -hmm. And I buy 30 year fixed rate debt. So I had to play their game until I got big enough. And, okay. and, I, and so their game is that adjustable rate mortgage, three, five, and seven. And for the longest time, it didn't really matter because rates were in a trading range. Up, hey, was you know, a little bit easier. Yeah. Within a point who cared? You know, it was like, eh, big deal. If I have to refine, it's 50 basis points higher. It doesn't matter over the last five years, the rents are going to cover that differential. Who cares? Mm -hmm. Not in this market. So um, after I got big enough, I think we got to the point where we had probably, uh, I don't know, 25 to 30 buildings. And when mm -hmm. I say buildings, it can be single family all the way up to a 12 plex. Okay. Um, but um when we got to that point, I said, you know what? I'm big enough. I need to start telling the banks what I want. And right. so- Right, now you can settle. You have a little bit more leverage there. Exactly. For sure. Exactly. So I had relationships with six different banks. Okay. Um, it was, um, 
I was loyal to them until they told me they didn't want me to come home anymore. You That's know? a good way to go. You know, it was like, no, 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 we don't want any more of your business. I was like, you're sure. Like, yep. You're like, you do realize I'm not going to stop dating. They're like, no, yeah. we understand. So I would go and find the next bank. And so I had six banks and I looked at it and I just said, okay, these are the two banks that I still want to do business with. These other four, I can't stand working with them. Okay. Um, one of them rhymes with Schmel's Margot. Um, and so we ended up finding uh, a bank and I basically built my own slide deck for them. And I said, this is the business. This is what I do. These are my returns. Um, this has been my growth. This has been my on-time pay rate. And I walked them through my business because right. at that point they weren't just looking for, I, I needed to show them that I wasn't just a borrower, that I was an operator. Right. And you weren't just, you weren't just the single guy buying a duplex here and a condo here, but this was really a legit undertaking with operations and, and a real company. Yep. Even though I was Bugs Bunny and wore all those hats. Mm -hmm. I wore all the hats well. And so I could talk about any part of my business. And so mm -hmm. in having that conversation with the bank and walking through that with them, I basically, they said, so what is it that you want from us? I said, I'm so glad you asked. I want you to make a product for me. So I stole something a little bit from Michael Burry from the great short or the big short, stole mm -hmm. something from him because he basically had companies, banks make collateralized debt obligations, CDOs, which are basically the mm -hmm. back end of mortgages and they're bundled together. So I said- Great movie like, for anybody that has not seen the big show. Not, you got to watch it. Go you watch it. Phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal. And so I basically stole something from that movie and I just said, I want you to make a product for me. And they're like, mm -hmm. what do you want this product to be? I said, I want it to be 30 year fixed rate debt on any asset, four units and under. I love dupes, tries and quads because they're liquid. Right. Um, a five to 20 unit, they aren't that liquid. They're liquid right now because there's a lot of cash on the sidelines, but they won't be. And the debt mm -hmm. structure on them is horrible. It's all that adjustable rate stuff. And you might be paying 9% in three years. You know, you don't know. And so I worked with them and we designed a product. And the product, wow. I came to build a product for me. And it allowed me to get 30 year fixed rate debt on unlimited number of mortgages. Um, Fantastic. And that was, yeah. And that was two on twos, threes, and fours. Anything that's more than four, anything that's five and up, I still have to do commercial debt on, but on the okay. twos, threes, and fours, I have 30 year fixed rate debt on any asset I use on any asset that I buy. And do you still have to put down a 25%? I have to put down. So that was negotiated. I have to put down 20. Okay. Which um, still which in this market is great. <laughs> phenomenal. Yep. So I have to put down 20. Uh, but the other really cool part about it is now it's 30 year fixed rate debt. I don't ever have to worry about that mortgage again. Yeah. And so the way that I got them to, yes, read the slides and go through all of that, the, 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 the real piece that I dangled, the carrot. So that was the stick. Now there was the carrot. And the carrot mm -hmm. was, I will refinance. I will bring over 23 deals to your bank. Was there a time limit for that? Uh, it was, I will do, I will do, we'll basically split them in half. So I did... Uh, and we ended up doing a little bit more than we ended up doing three transactions instead of two, but it was nine, 10 and four. Okay. So you brought over your whole portfolio to that. Um, bank. Most of my portfolio. Yeah. About, about 90, about 90% 90 at the time, about 90% of my portfolio. Gotcha. And even though it's that fixed rate, how do you feel that the interest rates that you receive are compared to kind of what else is up on the market right now? So at that time, because I saw what we're going through now happening. And so mm -hmm. I locked in, I have 27 mortgages at sub four. Wow. And for investment properties, we're not yes. talking owner occupied people. Nope. Investment properties. Right. Um, and is there like a time frame that you're allowed to continue that locked in rate or is that like in perpetuity? So that locked in rate was only at that time. It's still priced like normal mortgages, but what they do is I think they, I forget what they actually tagged it to. Cause usually a bank will tag it to an index. And they'll say mm -hmm. it's this plus. And so now that same debt costs me 6%. Okay. But it's still 30 year fixed and it's still 20% down. And well, the thing for me is, is, you know, I would give up the point because a lot of that commercial debt now is a little over five on a five year. Yeah. I would pay the point extra and have 30 year fixed a hundred times out of a hundred. 
<laughs> right. So I just, right. so that's what, that's, what's helped my business really get to the point where my, the thing I most seek out is twos, threes, and fours. They're very liquid. I get 30 year fixed rate debt, whatever the debt structure is. And because I've got a decent enough portfolio now, I largely, because I'm in New Hampshire, I'm in three different towns with a combined population of 45,000. You were literally like housing the entire neighborhood. Close, but not, yeah, but close. I'm, I'm good, in, well, good I, yeah, I mean, the nice thing is, is, you know, I started out as a peon with one and now mm -hmm. I'm in the top 20 real estate investors in my market. Wow. Huge accomplishment. And only, and once again, and not that long yeah. time frame. Yeah. I mean, over probably the, the accelerator was probably about 10 years, but I did yeah. all my research when, before I picked a city. So I, my city was named fastest growing, the, my main business, fastest growing city five years in a row. So I had done all the research. So five years before that, I was like, this place is poised for a pop. Yeah. I mean, all the other places around it, wicked overbuilt. There's they're putting in, they're doubling the size of the, of the, of the bridge both ways. Like everything is going to open up for this place. And so that's where I started doing all my investment. So when you started buying in that area, I totally can see then once again, the work that you put into it to be able to identify that market. But years later, clearly, as you see some of those changes taking place, prices are getting more expensive. Yes, rents are going up. Mm -hmm. But did you continue to buy? You clearly did continue to buy in that area. But there, was there a point that you were kind of, that you ever said, hey, listen, now prices got too high. Now this place, you know, it was, you know, top grow, top fastest growing. Now that's already kind of spent. I need to start looking somewhere else. Or have you kind of said like, nope, this is my market. I'm sticking with it. So yeah, so I went the next town over and then the next town over. Yep. So oh, you I wanted, started to spread out. I just started to spread out. Yeah. The big thing for me was, I think that it's really funny where people say, well, there's not, there's not enough opportunity. What do you want a hundred to choose from? Right. You want a hundred great, great deals to choose from? You Wall Street's going to step in. They're going to buy <laughs> the whole thing. You need one great deal. That's it. Right. Just one. So I would do the work every single day. I knew my market. I knew it cold. I knew what rents were. I knew streets. I knew all that I needed to know. And that way, when something popped in the market, within three seconds, my broker would get something saying, need to see it. Let's get in there. And we did a bunch of deals. That day. I, I had one uh, contest that I did, which was called the million dollar challenge, which was buy something for 250 and within a year, turn it into a million dollars worth of assets. And I did. That's how we did that. So yeah, I bought a house. Kelly was hanging. Yeah. I bought an, I bought I bought a house where I was just like, there's value add here. Um, it came on the market at midnight. By nine a.m., I had my I had a showing there. By nine thirty, they had a PNS, and I mm -hmm. said it expires tonight at five, and I'll give you full price. And this was um, a couple of years ago before all the over overspending happened. Um, got it. They agreed. I said, I'll take it in as in his condition, no inspections because I have experience. So I could walk it and go, I know exactly what I need to do here. So right. bought it for 250, put 65,000 into it and then sold it for 550, 90 days later after the work I did. I took that 200, basically $240,000 net that I made on that deal mm -hmm. because I did it private sale. I didn't do it through a broker. Um, so I did made 240 grand on that deal. I took that 240. And I bought other assets and then mm -hmm. spent and between down payments and spending a little of that money, that 240, I turned into three more buildings. Right. Um, and then those three buildings was just under a million. And then one, I actually did the work, refinanced out, and that got me over a million dollars in a year. Wow. What did you win for winning the challenge? Um, I won a really cool video on YouTube and that's it. My friends, you said that my, my, my friends paid me nothing. I was just like, <laughs> like, what do you want? You made a million dollars. And I was like, I want you to pay me. Yes. <laughs> That's why it's a challenge. I feel like you even would have been happy if they gave you like five bucks, right? You yeah, would have exactly. taken your wife out to McDonald's. Exactly. I was, I was like, I think, I think hot dogs are on you, bro. Like, let's do yeah. this. Like, seriously. Yeah. That's, that's really cool. That's, that's awesome. And I, I, Personally, too, anything that you can throw a little bit of competition in some things, all of a sudden yeah. people start to get a little more creative and are, are like really need to see that through. Um, I, I can't believe they didn't at least send you a trophy or something. Nothing. But nothing. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But either way, they are right. You still you still made out well on that deal, so hopefully that'll make it a little bit easier to sleep it's, at night without it, your without it's your soft, Yeah, it's softened the it softened the blow. You know, having now <laughs> three revenue performing assets that bring in about six thousand bucks a month. I'm good.
I'm okay. We'll be okay. We'll we'll make it through that. You just take that money to like wipe up your tears, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. So that'll yeah. help. So one question that I have a feeling that some of our landlords are thinking about that I've kind of skipped over that I'd like to kind of come back to is 121 units. Yes. Over 41 buildings. Yes. Do you self-manage or use a property manager? Yes. I self-manage. I know. I was say, I know the answer to that question. Yeah, yeah. So you self-manage. And you work full-time? Yes. Okay. How do you manage it all? Um, good processes. Good processes. Being in the tech world and um, understanding how to build a business, um, it really comes down to processes. It comes down to being able to have a standard process for anything that comes up. Whatever it is that comes up, standard process. And so, you know, for years, that was also without a property management software too. We just did it all spreadsheet. Right. And, and so, we, yeah, we just went to a property management system where I'm like, holy cow, this is awesome. You know, and my wife's like, we need to spend the 250 a month for this thing. And I was like, yeah. all right, all right, it's $3,000 a year. That's a lot of money. Um, but yeah, so bought it. And so now the cool thing is, is that every tenant gets a portal. They log into the portal. They log the problem. And then I see mm -hmm. it on my phone and then I can assign it to the person that needs to have it assigned to them. So Wait, this person that assigned that you assign it to somebody else. So yep, do you have like be, a team you mean, or nope, it might be a plumber. It might be gotcha. a carpenter. It might be a appliance repair person. So I always talk about your only is, you know, your, your, your network is your net worth. And mm -hmm. so for me, it was making sure that the right guys in the area. So I have a primary and a backup for a plumber. I have a primary and backup electrician. I have a primary and a backup carpenter. Um, I have a primary and a backup handyman. And so that way it's literally right. something as simple as I used to answer all the calls myself and do the work. Now in the last few years, I've been able to do less of the work, but I still am the quarterback. I still right. head coach. I still manage everything, which is I'll send this text to this guy or this text to this guy. And then the situation gets handled. And so because I have great process, I get to keep hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in my pocket mm -hmm. for that. I don't have to pay to a property management company. It's right. And then that's, that's really what being a leader and kind of that manager is, is being yes. able to kind of triage yes. where things go and, yep. and, um, and making sure that you're protecting your time, but still increasing revenue because you're still, you're still buying properties. You're still yes. buying them. Yeah. I got three deals in contract right now. Right. Yeah. So in our last like, minute or two here, I wanted to ask if you could go back and mm -hmm. redo your portfolio, what mm -hmm. would be the one thing that you would change? I would have avoided my first or my second, my third uh, purchases, the two triplexes. Why? Wrong city. Wrong city. It was the wrong place. Um, yeah. Extremely over the top um, inspectors. Um, every year where they would come around, it was another three to 5,000 bucks worth of stuff that they wanted to see done. Wasn't right. in the code and air quotation marks wanted to see done. Yeah. Um, and so it was just, it was like, guys, it's never going to stop with you. It's like this one and this one, like these are, these are things that are nice to have. They're not nothing. There's no life or safety issue here. There's just like, you have a feeling. And yeah. I was like, and I can't pay that much for your feelings. <laughs> and so it was like, nope, we got to get out of here. We got to get into a place that's pro landlord that understands that our taxes pay for all these city services. Right. And that I have no problem. I want to know if there's ever a life safety issue. I want to fix it immediately. I want to know if my tenant has a problem with whatever it is, mm -hmm. but there are certain things where it's like, I know when the roof needs fixing. I don't need you to say, well, we see a little problem up there. So we want the whole thing replaced based right. on your experience in construction. No, you're an inspector. You don't know that. Right. And so from my perspective, it was really just getting in a, a more pro landlord area that really okay. understood that the landlord has to spend that money. So if I did do over again, I wouldn't do those two buildings. I would have, I would have gone to the city that I ended up in. Nice. Okay. So, so, okay. Gotcha. But we've moved on from that. We seem like we're in a pretty good spot. There, we found a way to make do. Right. Well, Matt, thank you very much for joining me today um, and sharing your, your really amazing journey. I feel like we might have to have you back on for a part two to dive into some other topics over happy here too. To. Yeah. Happy but, to. I will make sure to put contact information down in show notes for you so our members can kind of reach out and also learn a little bit more about you. But thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate you being here. I was thrilled to do it. I'm happy to come back. So thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it.
course. Um, for any of our listeners out there, do make sure to hit the subscribe button or the like button, whether you're watching us over on YouTube or wherever you listen to us on your podcast. We release new episodes every single Tuesday of the Lady Landlords podcast. Thank you so much. And we will see you again next week. Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you're feeling stuck in your real estate journey, visit lady-landlords.com slash roadmap to book a one-on-one -on -one workshop with me. I'll help you determine your next best strategy. Or you could subscribe to our newsletter for exclusive tips and offers. Invest with confidence, become a lady landlord today.